Hey guys, welcome to Trinity Church Online. For more information, please visit us at ourtrinity.org or you can find us on Facebook at Trinity Church of Wheat Ridge or even on Instagram at Trinity Church CO. No matter where you are today, we are glad that you have joined us here. Good morning, Trinity. Please stand and worship with us today. Oh 
to say, welcome, church. I want you to think about that. Your church, his ecclesia, his called out ones. You are special. And the scripture says that the gates of hell will not prevail against his church. That includes you. And I want you to know that we are a family. We pray for one another. We encourage one another. We strengthen one another. We say that we're to be connected to God and to one another and to our community. That we're to be contagious, but not just contagious, impactful with God and with one another and with our community. So we want you to, to think about those challenges that we have before us. We're glad you're worshiping with us on this Labor Day weekend. If you take your bulletin, there's a few things we want to highlight with you, some upcoming events and things that maybe are not there as well. A Jerusalem travelogue is going to be next Sunday after the morning service. I want you to be aware of that. That is going to be over in the Evergreen Room. And then you'll see a flyer in your bulletin concerning the ladies' Bible study that's going to get started. I want you to know that they will have the current health mandates in place, but they also will finish their study of Gideon. So if you're interested in either that morning or evening study, uh, please just mark that and hand that. Since we're taking our offering uh, at the back door, you'll make sure that you just place that in the offering plate uh, uh, as well. And let's be praying. Uh, I don't know if you've seen the invitation that's going to come September 26, 2020. Franklin Graham's going to be having a prayer walk upon Washington. We may not be able to take a bus and actually go there, but we can certainly be praying for them. Some of you may want to take that trip out there, visit the nation's capital and stand with them in prayer, but let's be in prayer about that. That's the 26th of this month. Let's bow together. Father, speak to us through your word, through the enablement of your Holy Spirit today. That word may come through a song. It may come through the message. It may come through a time of having communion together. But word of God, speak to us. Not information, but a transformation in our heart. We've come to sit at your feet. We've come to worship you, O oh God. So set our hearts in that place to be able to receive and to apply that which you've given to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's continue standing as we worship together. Our God is unstoppable, amen. Amen.
shall be impossible. Your kingdom reigns unstoppable. We'll shout your praise forevermore. Jesus, our God, unstoppable. Nothing shall be impossible. Your kingdom reigns unstoppable. We'll shout your praise forevermore. Jesus, our God, unstoppable. Nothing shall be impossible. Your kingdom reigns unstoppable. We'll shout your praise forevermore. Jesus, our God, unstoppable. teach me for you are the God of my salvation for you I wait all the day long remember your mercy O Lord and your steadfast love for they have been from of old remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions according to your steadfast love remember me for the sake of your goodness O Lord something that I, I just want to mention real quick. Um, so we, we don't require that you wear masks. Uh, you know, we're, we will never turn someone away simply because they're not wearing a mask. You know, our doors are always open. Uh, we don't want someone to walk in and feel uninvited or unwelcome. Uh, but we do have, um, and, and it's reasonable concerns, some, some concerns, people that are concerned about not wearing masks. Um, and, and I think something that, that we should do and something that's appropriate, and obviously if you're not able to, I totally understand, you know, we're, again, I, like I said, we're not going to force anyone to wear a mask. Uh, but when we are in the commons area, uh, when we're socializing, when we're speaking with each other, um, if you have a mask and if you're able to, uh, go ahead and wear it. Um, I know some people, they, they don't want to wear a mask, they, you know, science, blah, 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 all this stuff. I understand that, but we have some people that are concerned. And, and we do just want to be careful of that. We want them to feel comfortable to be here. Um, we want to be able to tell people, yes, we are doing everything we can um, to, you know, prevent the spread, whatever it may be. Uh, that's just something that I wanted to mention, um, something I've heard from a few people, and uh, we, we want to make sure that their concerns are, are, are known. Um, so keep that in mind. I'm going to do my best to wear it. Uh, it is something, it's just I'm not completely used to, so I do kind of forget, um, but that's something that we want to keep in mind. 
Uh, the person that I want to honor today is actually uh, Pastor Ed's wife, Kathy. Um, I don't know how many of you have seen on Facebook or have received emails about her um, from, from her heart to yours or from Kathy hearts to yours. Um, but those are real great words of encouragement. Um, I've heard very many good things from those things. If you haven't been receiving those, uh, let the office know uh, of your email address. Find us on Facebook if you have Facebook, because um, you can read those there. Kathy does a lot of things um, for the church here, working with, tr or with, with the children, uh, working with uh, decorations, stuff like that. And so if you haven't gotten that word from her, uh, it's been very encouraging. I've heard a lot of good things about those, and, I, and it's encouraged me as well. So I just wanted to honor her. Honor her. I, I think she's with the children today, so she's not in here, but... Um, she has really encouraged me with that word. So we have been on a, in a series of uh, parables, right? And this is where we're meeting ourselves. Uh, Jesus, most of his teaching, like about a third of his teaching anyway, was in parables. And uh, I think it's very important. I think it's very important for, for us to understand that, but to not just see them as a story that Jesus had told, a story that he had told his disciples or whoever was following him but as a, as a parable, a lesson for us to apply. And that's why we're emphasizing the meeting ourselves. All the parables that we have gone through is something that we need to apply in our own lives. And that's, that's no different today. Last week, do you remember what we looked at? I'm going to test you every week now. Every week. <laughs> the Good Samaritan. I don't know who said that, but that was, that was right. The Good Samaritan. There you go. The Good Samaritan, and we, and we looked at the attitudes of, well, it was five different people, right? Five different people in the story. We looked at their attitudes. And, and that was something that we needed to apply to our lives. Well, today, Jesus speaks to us in a parable in, in this passage about prayer. So let's look at our passage today. It, it's Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11, and we're going to start reading in verse 1. This is a very familiar passage. As we read it, at least a portion of it is for sure. And as we read it, it'll definitely sound familiar. It might sound a little different. Um, different translations have the words translated a little bit different. Uh, and so as you follow along, uh, just, just keep that in mind. So Luke chapter 11, starting in verse 1. Now Jesus was praying in a certain place. And when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins. For we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation. And, when, and he said to them, Which of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine has arrived on a journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And she will answer from within, Do not bother me. The door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is, because he is his friend, yet because of his impudence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. And I tell you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks it will be opened. Verse 11, what father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Father God, I pray that you will open our spiritual ears today. Help us to hear your word and to understand it. I pray that the Holy Spirit would speak to us. God, in your word, you tell us when two or more are gathered in your name, you are present with them, God, and we acknowledge your presence today, Lord. Speak to us through your word. Encourage us. Convict us. Help us to correct and, and, to, and to just grow in love and knowledge of you. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, so I'm going to be looking at this whole passage today. Uh, there, there's obviously the parable, and I, and I think there's a lesson within that parable, but I, don't, I didn't find that there was, what, 30 minutes worth of a lesson within that parable to me. But I also, as I was studying this passage and reading the context, I was like, this is a real emphasis on prayer in general. Uh, the disciples, they ask the Lord Jesus to teach them to pray. 
And so today, I, I want to remind us and, and to teach us how to pray, what Jesus wanted us to do as we pray. So today, we're going to look at the four P's of prayer. All right, I was a good pastor today. I'm using alliteration. So the four P's of prayer. And I, knowing how I spell words, I probably spell prayer with four P's anyway. So the first one, the first P, is priority. The priority of prayer. We see that in verse 1. Now Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. The first person that I want to point out with a priority to prayer is actually John the Baptist. John the Baptist. So in Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 4, we read, In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. One of the first things that, come to my, that comes to mind when I think of John was John was a man's man, as they say, right? How they describe him here, he was wearing camel's fur and, and a leather belt, and he would eat locusts, and he was always out in the wilderness, just, you know, and, and as Isaiah said, he was preparing the way of the Lord. A lot of times we picture him as a man's man. A lot of times we picture him, as his name says, as a baptizer. He would baptize those, and, and, the, and what he would do is he would call those to repentance. He would call the people to repentance. He was the one that the Lord would prophesy that would bring people to the, to the, 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 the grounds where Jesus would come. So he would prepare the way and say, this is the way that the Lord is going to be coming. So that was John the Baptist. But one of the things that I find here is that John the Baptist was a man of prayer. We don't read that a lot in scripture, but I think this verse right here really does emphasize that. John was a man of prayers. His disciples, they would ask him questions, and I, and I imagine this, they would say, how do you survive in the wilderness? Man, how are you always out there? How, how, does, how, do, how are you sustained? Where do you get your strength to stand and it, for what you believe? He would stand up against the Pharisees and Sadducees all the time. He would stand up and say, no. They would ask him, are you a prophet? Are you Elijah? And he would say, no, I'm not. But he would say, I am the one that is preparing the way for someone that is greater than I am. See, it doesn't matter how strong or great you think you are. You still need prayer in your life. And that's how John was. John the Baptist, he was, a, he was a man's man. He was very strong. He was very wise. When he, was, when he was in the womb, he was filled with the Holy Spirit. But he still needed prayer. See, we will be nothing without prayer. No matter how strong you are, no matter how, how great you think you are mentally and physically, without prayer, we will, we will amount to nothing. So that's the first person that really put a priority on prayer was John the Baptist. He taught those that were following him how to pray. The second group of we, uh, people that we see that want a priority in prayer are the disciples. We see that when they say, Lord, teach us to pray. These men were with Jesus all the time, right? The, the very few moments that they weren't is when Jesus would go off by himself to pray. Sometimes we can give them a hard time, though, thinking that, you know what? If we were with Jesus, if we were with the Savior the whole time, we would probably do better than them, right? We would probably be like, man, if I was with, with Jesus all the time, whew, I would be a good Christian. You know, sometimes we give them a hard time, but what they needed to do is they needed to learn how to pray as well. These were great spiritual men, and they loved God, and they, they loved their teacher. And see, they went on to lead many Christians, right? They went on all these missionary journeys all over the world. They planted many churches. See, I pray that my faith would be half as strong as, as many of these disciples, Man, they had a belief and, and trust in their Savior. But what they understood is that they lacked in their prayer life. They understood that that was an important thing that they needed. They were with Jesus, and they witnessed him pray many, many times. They were also with Jesus and, and witnessed the miracles. They were with Jesus, and they saw the crowds that Jesus brought. Right? Jesus was surrounded by so many crowds, he would go out onto a boat, and he would just to separate himself so then everyone could hear. Jesus was surrounded. He was a great teacher. But one thing that they don't ask is they don't ask, Jesus, teach us how to do miracles. They don't ask, Jesus, teach us how to preach a great sermon. Teach us how to be great teachers. What they ask is, Jesus, teach us to pray. Because what they saw in Jesus' life was that prayer was the most important thing to him. 
that before any of the decisions, before any of the tough things that happened in, in our Savior's life, he would pray, and the disciples saw that. The disciples, when you read the, uh, the later on in the New Testament, they could perform miracles by the Spirit, but yet they wanted to pray. See, even as the disciples, we need Jesus to teach us to pray. Prayer is so simple that the smallest child can pray, right? We ask children in, in children's church, you know, pray, and, and it's always, you know, to us, we're like, oh, that's so sweet and cute. You know, it's so simple that the smallest child can pray, but it is also so great that the mightiest man of God cannot be said to truly have mastered it yet. Prayer is an important thing to the disciples, and are we disciples of Jesus? Right? Are we? We're followers, right? We're followers of Jesus. It's, it needs to be an important thing to us as well. So John the Baptist prioritized prayer. The disciples prioritized prayer. But I think the third, por- the third person, to me, is probably the most important, the, 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 the largest example that we have that shows the priority of prayer, and that's Jesus himself. We read many times in the New Testament of Jesus praying, right? We see him praying at his baptism. When he's choosing the 12, he prays before that. As as the crowds increase around him, as all the numbers increase, he prays. Before he even asks the 12 to confess their faith, he prays. When he's on the mountain, uh, Mount of Olives at at his transfiguration, he prays there. When you read the book of Luke, uh, of all the gospels, Luke really puts an emphasis on prayer. All those things that I mentioned can be found in Luke. In Hebrews 5, chapter, uh, sorry, Hebrews 5, verse 7, we read, In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. Do you understand that? Jesus, the perfect son of God, prayed. See, see what, 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 what we need to do is we need to understand that. We, we, we can't get stuck in the routine of saying, you know, thank you for our food, thank you for this day, amen, right? Do you, whenever we read Jesus praying, is that how Jesus prays? And I'm not saying, you know, if you say thank you for your food or thank you for this day, it's a bad thing, right? But when we read Jesus praying, do you know what he's doing? He's crying, you see tears. He, he's, he's praying with emotion. In Luke 22, 30, uh, verses 39 through 44, we read, and he came out and went as his... Uh, as his, was his custom, to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temp- temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, nevertheless not my will, but yours be done. Listen in verse 43, ready? And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him, and being in agony, He prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. He was in prayer. Man, if, 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 I don't know of how many of you have actually been in prayer like that, where you were in in, in great distress, where you were crying out to your Savior. See, Matthew said he actually prayed this. He did this three times. Remember, he, he would pray, and then he would go to his disciples, and they were asleep, and he would say, you know, you need to be awake. Be aware of, the, uh, you know, of temptation. He would go back, and he would pray this again. He would say, Father, if you are willing, please take this cup from me. He would do this. He did this three times, and an angel would come and strengthen him. See, Jesus, although he was 100% human, he was also 100% God, and we need to find our confidence in our prayer. Jesus found his strength in prayer. But we have the gall to say that we don't need prayer. Now, I don't think any of you would say that, right? If I was to ask you, do you need prayer? I don't think any of you would say, no, I don't need prayer. But I think we say that with our actions. See, not every time we, we pray needs to be, you know, a, a great grand thing. But whenever we're making decisions, whether they're hard or easy, you know, whenever, whenever we are in need of comfort or an answer, do we turn to prayer? Or do we turn to friends, family, prescriptions, whatever it may be? Where do we turn? See, do we turn to prayer? Or do we turn to something else? Jesus, although being fully God, still turned to the Father in prayer. Jesus prioritized prayer. So I want to ask you, have we prioritized prayer? In your own life, have you made it a priority that uh, every decision... Just a simple prayer towards God. Whatever it may be, it doesn't have to be long. It doesn't have to be sweating drops of blood. 
but have we prioritized it still? So that's the first thing that I, I see in this passage is the priority of prayer in our lives. The second thing we see is a pattern of prayer. That's the second P, the pattern of prayer. We see this in verse 2 through 4. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins. For we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation. So there is nothing wrong with praying this prayer. Uh, when we were in school, man, I forgot to ask my wife this. I, I always forget the name of this, uh, or Jared or Sterling. So once a month, we would have a special, I don't, what was the name? Do you remember the name? Reflections. There we go. So once a month, we would always have a special uh, get-together, I guess I'll say, uh, Sunday afternoon. So we would have Sunday morning service, and then in the middle of the afternoon when you're supposed to take a nap or do homework, whatever it may be, we had this thing called Reflections. And what it was is it, it was these people that would, it was pretty much just an opportunity for those that did music or art or speech to present a, an offering to God, to worship God in it. Um, and it was a cool thing. I mean, I enjoyed some of them. Sometimes it was a little bit of a burden because it, it was mandatory to go. Um, and sometimes I had stuff to do and I'm like, oh, you know. But every single reflection, we would always start with the Lord's Prayer. We would start every single time with this. And, and some people, they didn't like it from the standpoint of, man, well, all we're doing is just standing there and reciting it. It's, just sort of, it's sort of like the Pledge of Allegiance, you know? They're just standing there and reciting it. And I can understand that, but at the same time, maybe you're just standing there and reciting it, you know? That maybe that's where your heart is in the issue. Sometimes it can, it can come from that, that memorization part of our heart, but I think it can also come from a genuineness of our heart as well. So if we're, if we're praying this and reciting this prayer, and, and I think it's a great thing to pray with Scripture, to recite Scripture in our prayer. It's a great thing to do. But is it coming from a heart of, of genuine belief, a genuine desire that these things are true in your life, or is it just something that God told us to pray like this, so I'm just going to pray like this? So that's something that I, I want to just bring up right now, is just to let you know, like, yes, if you want to pray this word for word, and it comes from a heart that, that you believe all these things that you're tra uh, praying, then continue to do so. But I, I also want to see that I think it's more of a pattern and not a script. I think when Jesus teaches this, it, it's, it's more of a, a pattern and not really a script. We also see that Jesus teaches the same prayer on the Sermon on the Mount, but he changes it a little bit. Now, was Jesus messing up? Was Jesus, which one is right, you know? Which one are we supposed to say? I think Jesus' emphasis is the pattern because the pattern, even though the words are slightly different, the pattern is consistent with them. So I want to look at the pattern today so when we pray, we can have this in mind. The first thing is when he says, Father, hallowed be your name. First thing we need to do is we need to approach him as his children. I've said it many times, God's favorite name for him that we, that we could speak to him is, is the word Father. And I think the reason why, is, or why I believe that is because Jesus tells us that. When, he, when his disciples ask, how do we pray? He starts with, Father. And this, this prayer isn't Jesus' prayer. From the standpoint of, he never prayed this. Because if you read this, it says, forgive us our sins. Jesus didn't need forgiveness from sins, right? What Jesus is doing is he's telling his disciples, these are the things that you need to do. And the first thing you need to acknowledge is that you are a child of God. You are a child of God. In Proverbs 15, verse 29, the Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayer of the righteous. Being a child of God is a great thing, and it's not because we're righteous, right? It's not of our own righteousness. It's because we have been adopted by Jesus, or into the family. We're joint heirs with Jesus Christ, and because of him, God sees his righteousness in our lives. In that verse that we just read, God doesn't hear the prayers of the unrighteous. He is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayer of the righteous. We have been adopted into the family of God, and we have been given the ability to call him Father. That's a great thing. And if we go into prayer understanding that, you know, Father in heaven, that's a great thing that we can acknowledge. Jesus, he's up there. He's interceding with us. He says, hey, these are my brothers and sisters. These are their prayer requests. He's interceding for us. So that's the first thing we need to know is that we're approaching him as, as our heavenly father. The second thing is it says, hallowed be your name. Now, this isn't just a greeting. 
This isn't just saying, Father, who is holy. It's not just a God. This is, I'm speaking to this God, not, not another God. This is the holy God. This isn't just a greeting. What this is, is this shows a prayer that is desired to bring honor to God's name. When we pray, it needs to be our goal to bring God, honor to God's name. And yes, in every single prayer. Sometimes, like, uh, how many of you know the song? I know we've sung it before. I can only imagine. You know that song, right? I love that song. I like that song. There's a lot of truth in that song. We don't know our response in heaven, right? I, 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 exactly what it's going to be, but I know what it's not going to be. I know when we enter the throne room, when we, when we are in the presence of Jesus and God, I know our response is not going to be, all right, so what do I get? You know, pay up, right? I did all these good things. That is not going to be our response, right? Our response is going to be, holy, 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 worthy is the lamb that was slain. We're going to see God in all of his majesty and all of his glory. You know, we, maybe we might dance, we might fall to our knees. I'm not sure exactly of what my body's going to do, but it's probably going to do some weird things, honestly, because we're going to be in the presence of God and, and see his greatness. So when we pray, that needs to be our desire. Our, our desire needs to be honoring God. Our prayer should be crying out for how awesome our God is. In Hebrews 4, verse 6, uh, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, we read, Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help him in time of need. God is great and a powerful being that we can call Father. See, holy is the Lord God Almighty, right? How many of you have said that in your prayer? Holy is the Lord God Almighty. The universe speaks of his glory, and yet it's just the hem of his garments. We read that in Psalm. It's an amazing thing. He is our Father, and we can confidently come to him in our prayers. That's an amazing, we need to be excited about that. And I'm talking about even like simple prayers. If we're right before dinner, you know, I always put priority of thanking God for food, doing all the, I'm trying to think of these things. Man, are you showing that honoring God's name in your prayers? Even the smallest prayers, we need to be bringing God glory. Does your prayer life reflect that? Now, I don't say we need to have lengthy prayers. Right? How many of you have, have sat down at dinner and someone's praying before dinner and it was just like, whew, like you get the smell of food in your face and you're just like, man, we just wanted you to thank the, for the food, you know, and it's just this lengthy prayer. They're reading like the entire book of Psalms, you know, they're doing this thing. How many of you sat there? It doesn't need to be a lengthy prayer, right? In Proverbs, we read that, you know, it's God is in heaven. We are in earth. Our words need to be few, right? It's one of those things where we can honor God and praise him for who he is with few words. So I'm not saying that we need to have lengthy prayers every single time. But where is your heart? See, are we thinking of the words that we're actually saying? Are we just muttering a prayer? You know, Derek, say grace before the dinner. Okay, thank you for this day. Thank you for this food. It's good, I hope. Amen. Right? It's just, is it something that we're muttering, or is it something that we're actually praying from our hearts? So when we pray, let our hearts desire to bring honor to God's name. That's the first thing in our pattern of prayer is a heart to, uh, desire to bring honor to God's name. The second part is we see in this prayer is your kingdom come. When we pray, we are seeking God's will in whatever the matter is. When we pray, we are seeking God's will. When Jesus was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, was his request out of line? When he, when he, when he prayed in the verses we read earlier, when he said it, Father, if there's any other way, please take this cup from me. Was that out of line? I don't think so, because when he was praying, he said, but your will, not my will, be done. Yes, Jesus in, in his flesh, he, he understood the pain he was about to endure. He, knew, he knows what pain is like. But he still told God, you know, but I understand what's about to happen. And God, if there was any other way, please present that way. But your will be done, not my own will. Your will be done. He sought God's will and was obedient to that will. Warren Wearsby says, It has well been said that the purpose of prayer is not to, get man, not to get man's will done in heaven, but to get God's will done on earth. Prayer is not telling God what we want and then selfishly enjoying it. 
Prayer is asking God to use us to accomplish what he wants us, what he wants, so that his name is glorified, his kingdom is extended and strengthened, and his will is done. I must tell all of my personal requests by these overruling concerns if I expect God to hear and answer my prayers. Often prayers can be turned into a me show, right? It's all about what your desires are, all about what you want. Father, I want this. I need this to happen. Give me this. I want this. And we can pray for our needs, and we'll look at that in a little bit. But when we pray, we need to be centered on the will of God and his kingdom. We must see the responsibility that he has given us on this earth as an honor. See, what God has done is he's allowed us to partake in his will. If God didn't want you to, to, if you didn't have a purpose on earth, if you still weren't in his will doing things, guess what? He would, you would be in heaven. You will not die until God is ready for you to be off this earth. You are still part of God's will. We, we pray, Father, your will be done in my own life. In this request I'm making, it, it's a difficult season of my life, though, right? Jesus, he was in probably the, deep, the darkest moment in his life. He was about to be betrayed by one of his followers. And yet he still asked God, your will be done in my life. No matter the season, the time of life that we are in, we need to be praying for God's will. See, when we have a thorn in our flesh like Paul, and we ask for its removal, are we okay with what God's will is for us, though? Imagine if you knew how you were about to die and what was going to happen and the pain that you were about to partake in. Would you still pray, Father, your will be done? See, that's what Jesus did. He understood. He knew what was about to take place. And he still prayed, Father, your will be done. But when we pray for God's will, it's not always revealed to us exactly what will happen. But it's not always right then, and it's not always the way we expect to. See, we can get frozen in our walks seeking God's will. But what can happen is we don't know where we're supposed to go. We pray for God's will, but we don't get a response right away. And so we, we're, we're kind of stuck. How many of you have been there before? We were praying for God's will, and you just you don't know where to go, and it's like, you know, it's not as simple as a left or right, but I'm going to use that example, right? And you're like, where do I go? I don't think God really desires that. I think what God desires for you to do is to pray in his will. If you're seeking his will, make a decision. Because if you're seeking his will and you, you make a decision that isn't in line, guess what? His will will still come to, in, into fruition, right? He'll still guide you in his will if you're seeking to follow it. He doesn't desire that you get frozen and that, that you're stuck there, not able to make any decisions because you haven't heard from him, right? He wants you to make those decisions, to follow his word, and that will guide you in his will. So many times, uh, sometimes I've heard people would pray, you know, God's will be done in the matter, but it's not really what scripture has said before. It's like, you know, oh, I, I, I really, you know, God, if it's your will, let me marry this person. But it's an unbeliever, and God says in his word to not be unequally yoked. It's one of those things where it's like, I think God is telling you his will already. Remember, we may not always like the answer that we get from God, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't continue on the path of his will. And we'll look at why we need to continue on that path. In Proverbs 3, verse 6, read, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lead on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. See, if we, if we trust in the Lord with all our heart, and we don't lean on our own understanding, we're putting it in God's hands, and if we're acknowledging him in all the steps that we're taking, he will guide your path. He will guide your path. And I, I had a lot of friends in college that didn't know what they really wanted to do, and they were, they were kind of waiting for a response. I, w I was sort of one of those people. When, when I was in college, I was a business major, and I was seeking God's will after because I, I wanted to go into ministry, but I, I wasn't really sure where God wanted me to go. Well, my wife is from New Jersey, and there was a summer that I actually interned at a church in New Jersey. This church was great. I loved this church. It was, you know, my wife went there. Her family goes there. There was a lot of people. I interned there for a whole month. I, I made good relationships. And when I started praying, you know, God, where do you want me to go? The youth pastor at that church actually left. So there was a position open. And I was like, wow, you know, a couple months before I graduate, 
This position opens. I know the pastor. Like, there was a, it, it was perfect in, in a lot of ways, right? So the pastor and I, we were trying to connect, and we, we, we talked every once in a while. And, and Andrea and I, we, we were really trying to get me out there. You know, it was a great thing. I was like, I know the people Andrea wanted to be with her family, but, you know, it was God's will. We wanted to trust him in the matter. Man, I did everything I could. Whew. I, I did everything I could to be out there, and that, it, it just was not happening. And, it, and it's an amazing thing because it, it's, it should have. It, when you look at everything that was in place and, and, and all the steps that were, that were being taken, it should have happened. But it wasn't in God's will, and it, and it didn't happen. That was the priority that I put. I put God's will over my own desires. And I see that now because God has placed me here. God has put me in a church family that I absolutely love being around, and I see his, his guiding steps along the way. So it's not always the answer you're expecting, but it, it will always be what's good for you, and we'll see that later on. So God will direct your path. When we pray, let our desires be focused on the will of God and on his kingdom. The last pattern in prayer that we see is for our physical and spiritual needs. We see that when, when Jesus says, give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone else who is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation. God wants us to ask him for our needs. Now, it's not telling him what we need, but we're asking him for what we need. See, if I, I may tell, uh, tell God, I need a McDonald's cheeseburger today. There's some days I feel like I need a McDonald's cheeseburger, all right? Especially the fries. There's some days I'm like, I need those fries. But God's response may not always be providing a McDonald's cheeseburger, but it'll be providing a meal. See, God knows what's best for us and will provide it for us when we ask. And that's with our physical and spiritual needs. In prayer, we seek our daily provisions, forgiveness, and protection from evil. That's something when we pray, those, those are things that we need to be seeking. When we read here, give us, uh, where is it, get each day our daily bread. This is literal bread. I think some theologians try to really complicate and make everything super spiritual, but I believe this is literal bread. We ask God for enough to get us through that day. Right? If you woke up today, God has a purpose for it. And we're, yes, we're not even promised to the end of the day, but we are promised to be provided for what we need for the time that we have that day. God just wants us to ask for it. Second thing is we ask for forgiveness. We are in need of this daily just as much as we're in need of bread. As often as you eat, which me, for me is not often, but a lot at the same time, Man, I need forgiveness a lot. See, this is asked when, when we, when, and here, let me phrase it this way. So when we ask for forgiveness, we're, we're, we're showing that we have forgiven others, and we're representing that. But when we ask for forgiveness, we show that we have been forgiven at the same time. So it, it, it's kind of a circle when we read here that, and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us. Because we have been forgiven, we have the obligation to forgive others. And because we are forgiving others, we are now presenting to God, showing God, hey, I've been forgiven, and I'm, ex I'm needing more forgiveness. So it, it's kind of a circle right there. As we forgive others, we ask God for forgiveness. And because we have been forgiven, we can forgive others. And it's just a circle right here. And, and so it's a, a circle of forgiveness, and we need that in our lives. And it's not a God forgive me because I forgave someone else today. It's a we understanding we have been forgiven for all the great sins that we have committed. So I'm going to forgive them. And in return, I can ask for forgiveness. The, the third thing with our physical and spiritual needs is we ask for boldness in the face of temptation. We cannot withstand on our own. We cannot stand on our own strength. We need the spirit to help us. If we're being tempted with, with some evil and with some sin, we need to be able to stand our ground with that, and we need to ask God to help us in that time. If we're trying to do it on your own, I will promise you, you will fail. I have failed many times. But when I seek God, when I seek his power, when I ask the Spirit to give me strength, that is when you can overcome. 
That is when you're able to withstand the temptation. So that is the, pr- the pattern of prayer that we have. So the first was a priority in the prayer. The second one is a pattern. The third P is the persistence in prayer. Verses 5 through 8. And he said to them, Which of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has arrived on a journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within, Do not bother me. The door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, though, he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend. Yet because of his impudence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, it will be opened. So finally, the parable, right? You're like, I thought this was supposed to be about parables. Well, we're there now. And I think the, I think the context is important, though. So in those days, the family, they, they lived in a one-room house. So when the, the man says, the children are in bed with me, the family all slept together. And a lot of times what you'd see, and it wasn't always the case, you would see kind of a, a lifted area on the ground and then the floor. And the family, they would, all lift up, they would all sleep on the lifted area, and then the animals that they owned would sleep on the floor. So this was a crowded place. They'd have animals and, and the children and the, the wife and whatever family lived in the house all in one bed. Sometimes, and I had heard it put this way, is the door would actually be blocked by animals and by people because they were just, that's all the room they had, so they would just lay wherever they could. What was going to happen, though, how many of you have dogs? And as soon as someone, someone doesn't even have to knock on the door or ring the doorbell, right? You, if you have a dog that just barks all the time or it barks whenever someone is there, man, they go nuts, right? It'll wake up everybody in the house. That's the same thing. This man, what he's saying is like, we're already in bed. My children, my wife, we're in bed. The animals are asleep. Please don't bother us. Okay, it, it takes 10 minutes just for me to open the door, right? Please don't bother us. It, it, it's, it's, a, it's difficult to get to bed. But what this man did, this man at the door, is he showed extreme boldness. The word here, uh, impudence, is translated as shameless. What he did is he came to his neighbor in the middle of the night, right? And that's kind of bold in itself. But back then, you know, people would travel at night. So it wasn't like too, too weird to have a visitor at that time. But if you weren't expecting one, it was kind of weird, right? This man showed boldness. He went to his neighbor's house and he wasn't like, you know, like, hey, you awake? Bread, please? No, no right? He was like, hey, I need some bread. We got a midnight traveler. I got some family. I didn't know. Hey, I need some bread. Just like along the side of the house, right? I imagine he kind of went up to the window and his neighbor's just laying there like, go away, go away. The family's already asleep. And he like goes up to the window and kind of peeks his head in. He's like, hey, got any bread? You know, like he came with, with great boldness. It, it was with shamelessness. He, did, he didn't care. He was saying like, hey, I need some bread and you're my neighbor. And especially in that culture, Man, if you didn't provide bread for a neighbor, like, there was, like, shame put upon you. So it's one of those things where, like, oh. And so this guy knew. He's like, he's my neighbor. He's got to give me bread. Right? He, was, he had great boldness. So what's our lesson here? Is there a lesson that God is a grumpy neighbor who's asleep, and we need to go pound on the gates of heaven just to get our prayer request heard? Is that, is that the parable here? I hope you don't take it to mean that, because it's not what it means. In, in fact, I believe this is a parable of contrast. This is a parable of contrast. Our Father is loving, and he's always ready to answer us when we knock. He's always ready. But God often waits for our passionate, persistent prayer. God often waits for that. See, our persistence, it doesn't change God, but it changes us. It develops in us a heart and a passion for what God wants. Persistence in prayer is not an attempt to change God's mind. Remember, we're we're praying that God's will be done. We're not praying that our will be done. But we need to pray to get ourselves to the place where he can trust us with the answer. Philip Brooks says, prayer is not overcoming God's reluctance. It is laying hold of his highest willingness. When we pray and and, and we, we pray with persistency, God knows our hearts. God knows when we're ready for an answer. 
God knows what the answer is. He's not ready and like, hmm, hold on, hold on, wait. I'm trying to, he's not up there thinking, right? He knows what, it, what his answer is, but he knows what our heart is as well. So we need to be persistent, but also let us pray with boldness. See, we're in the throne room of God, not as someone that's about to be punished, but as his children. He wants us to ask from him. He wants us to be in continual prayer with him. How many of you enjoy just, just talking with your children, right? Especially when they're young and they're just like excited about school and they have like, oh, and then we did this today and then this, this kid fell in the sand and got sand in his shoe and then, and then they took off the shoe and then the sand fell out. Like you hear all these things, right? It's just constant, continual stuff. And sometimes it could probably get annoying. But if you're there listening, right, and you just hear the child just talking to you, that's how God is. He wants us to be there. He wants us to talk to him continuously. I think we may miss on blessings and even answers from God be simply because we give up. We may pray, pray a couple times for a specific request, and we, we don't get a response right away, or we don't see the answer, and so we just give up. See, God, is, is he, he knows, he wants to give us these blessings. But when we give up on our prayers, that shows our true desires. See, God knows your heart, and when you're ready for that answer, and it may not always be an answer that we expect, right? He may not always give you that Lamborghini. But when we pray, we show our desires for these things. I like to think of an example of a professional athlete. When it, I, I had a lot of friends. I never really had a desire to be a professional athlete. One, because I physically couldn't. But also, I was just like, eh, you know, that, that's, that's not my thing. But I had some friends that really wanted to become fresh. I had a, a friend that played hockey that actually was in semi-pro hockey. Um, and then he had gotten injured and, and just wasn't able to continue. But he had a real desire to play. If I was to, to show up with my friend, okay, and we're both like, yeah, we want to be professional hockey players. Okay, and we go to this training camp and the person's like, okay, well, here's the schedule, you know, five days a week, five hours a day. This is the, this is the training that we do. And I show up the first week, five days in a row, boom, same with my friend, we're doing these things. And then at the end of the first week, I go up to the trainer and I'm like, hey, am I pro yet? And he just kind of eyes me up and down. He's like, <laughs> nope, right? And while my friend, you know, I, I get a little discouraged, my friend's like, yeah, you're obviously not pro yet, right? So the next week I, I show up three days in a row and then I ask him, like, hey, am I, a, am I a pro yet? Like, I've, been, I've, I've done this for eight days now. And he's like, no, you're not a pro yet. So the next day, I, I show up late. And the week after that, I don't even show up. Right? I, locked, I lost that persistency. And what, what had happened, it showed my true desire. If I just stopped, if I quit, I'll never get that answer. And it may not be, I may not become a professional. But my friend who, who strived, who put in the time and the effort and that was always persistent, he will get an answer. Right? If he pushes to the end, he may become a professional. He may uh, get an answer to that request. See, that's what we need to do with our prayer. Be in persistent prayer, like, Father God, I need to answer this prayer. And, and it's not always a need, right? It's all, not always a me, me, me. Sometimes it's a, you know, Father God, I, I need some money this month just to pay rent. You know, and we, we, pray, we pray those prayers, but are we, are, is that our true desire that we want those funds from God? Or are we putting our trust in ourselves? See, not everyone that, that, that continues in prayers will always get the answer that they are expecting. But it'll always be what is good for them. Again, I, I say we'll look at that in a little bit. If you have not received an answer to prayer yet, keep praying. Keep praying. And sometimes, like I said, the answer may be no, right? If you haven't received an answer, if there, if there hasn't been a no, if that door hasn't been shut, keep praying. God wants you to. Verse 10 says that th these verbs, when it says to knock, or to ask and to seek and to knock, these are continuous verbs. It says keep asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking. God wants us to do those things. And we need to do so until we get an answer. See, if we're praying for God's will and to show honor to his name, we will continue to do so. And he will provide us an answer when he knows we are ready. So that was the third thing we see, and that was with the parable, is the pattern, or sorry, the 
persistency in prayer. The last P, the fourth P in here is the promises of prayer. And that's in verse 11. What father among you, if, he, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? When we ask God, God will provide what is good for us. When we're asking and seeking and knocking, he will always provide what is good for us. I love this verse here because Jesus reminds us that we are evil, right? He's talking to his disciples here. He says, then you who are evil, right? Imagine his disciples are like, geez, you know, okay, you know. Jesus is blunt. He says, you guys, you're evil, but you know how to give good gifts. How much more will the heavenly father? See, we can give what is good to our children, but God can always give and will always give what is better. A father knows what's best for a child. I remember oftentimes when I was a little kid, I, I would want something or ask for something, and I wouldn't always get it. And that's, that's because the father or the mother, they know what is best. Sometimes you, you would see a, something that looked like a fish. Over in the Middle East, they have, they have, you know, I think over here too, they have snakes that are in water. And I was like, see, I already don't like going in water if, I, if it's not clear and I can't see. But understanding that there's like snakes that could, no, I do not go in the water. My wife is practically a fish at this point. She loves water, but I will not go in it. I just can't stand it. But if a child was to see what looked like a fish out there from their point of view and say, hey, I want that, I want the fish. And they might have a desire like, yeah, that's a good, like they're hungry, they need a fish. But from the father's perspective, he understands that's a snake. No, you can't get that. No, that's a snake. I'm not gonna give you a snake. Instead, I'm going to protect you from that and give you the fish. Or, or sometimes uh, in those days, or, uh, it, over there, they have scorpions that are like albino scorpions. And they can be curled up, and they could look like an egg. And, and a child might see that and say, hey, I want an egg. Can you give me that egg? And the father would be like, uh, no, not that one. Because that one won't crack open the same. Here, I'll give you this one and give him a different egg. And I could picture a child be like, no, I want that egg, I want that egg, I want that egg. Not knowing, right? But the father, he knows what's best, and so he gives them the correct egg, the actual egg. Many times we ask God for things that are not good for us. Now, they're not always bad, but they're not good for us. There's something that is better for us. God will always watch out for his children and give them what is good. We need to have confidence in him and not be afraid of his answer to our prayers. There's been times that I, that I prayed, and it was something that, that I wanted that was good, but there was a part of me that understood, like, I don't know if I'm going to get that. And so I was kind of afraid to pray for it, because it's like, see, that, I want that, and that's good, and I, and I don't want the answer to be no. See, we need to have confidence when we go to prayer that whatever God gives us will always be good for us. And sometimes the answer is no. Sometimes it's not providing the thing that we may think is good for us. But we need to go with confidence and understanding like he, he, he knows what's best for me. And that's something that's convicted me to where I need to bring, I can bring everything to God in prayer. As the song goes, right? Bring everything to God in prayer and he will always give you what's best. God loves to give his spirit to those who ask. Now, we don't need to ask. If you've been saved, we don't need to ask for the Holy Spirit because we already have that. The moment of salvation, when we have turned to Jesus Christ and we've been saved, and we've been adopted in the family, we are filled with the Holy Spirit. But instead, when we ask, and, and, and we read this in, uh, I think in 1 Corinthians, where it says to not be filled with, with alcohol, but be filled with the Spirit, we're asking God to fill us with the Spirit to, that we want to live in obedience to the Holy Spirit, to, to His control. That's what we need to be asking God for because He will always give that to us. If we ask God to be controlled by His Spirit, He will. If we're willing to do it, He will always do it. When we humble, when we humble ourselves and seek God and ask for His Spirit to fill our lives, He will give it to us. So I want to end with a, a few questions. First one is, have you prioritized prayer? I've mentioned before in, in a previous sermon that prayer is, is a Christian's breath. 
Do you feel like you're suffocating? Or have you prioritized prayer and you're in constant communication with your Father? Have you forgotten how to pray? Have you forgotten what, what prayer is? Has it just become sort of like a script at this point, something that you just sort of recite that you have memorized? Or is it a prayer from the heart, a pattern of prayer that seeks to honor God, that seeks his will, and that seeks his, his provision? Third question is, have you given up on a specific prayer request without an answer yet? Maybe it's healing. Maybe, maybe it's some, some physical need that you may need. Have you just given up on that prayer because you haven't seen it yet? If you have not received an answer, do not give up. Be persistent in that prayer. God doesn't want you to give up. He wants you to keep knocking, keep asking, keep seeking. Have you forgotten the promise of God? God will always provide for you what is good and what is best for you. And it may not be always what we want. We may, we may think we want a fish. We may think we want an egg. But it may be snakes and scorpions. But God will always provide what is good for us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you that it is, it is good for correction, that it is good for, for teaching, that it is perfect, Lord. Father, help us to pray. As we've read this passage and as we, as we meditate on the words that you have given us, Lord, I pray that you would continue to teach your disciples to pray. Father, help us to honor you. Help us to seek your will in our prayers. Father, help us to be persistent. Help us to be, to be shameless and, and to come to you boldly. And Father God, help us to not forget the promises that you have made to us, that you will always give us what is good and what is best for us. Pray that you will protect us and bless us through this week and, and give us wisdom and eyes to see those that are in need. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand with me a minute. Ask God to prepare your heart for this Lord's table. Just in silence, just ask God to prepare your heart. Amen. You may be seated. So here we are again. Another communion. We've had scores of them. Jesus had one. Just one. 1 Corinthians 11 says the night he was betrayed. He took bread. He said, this is my body. Then he took a cup. And this is my blood. Why breaking a bread? Why a cup? Because going to somebody's house for a meal was different then than it is now. When you broke bread, you were saying, I'm coveting with you as a friend, as an ally. Jesus broke bread for us to be our friend, to be our ally. And then he took the cup, which represents his blood given in sacrifice. So we cannot come lightly to this table. You must come understanding the covenant every time you're entering into. He's your bread. 
He's your sustenance. He's your life. It should have been your body. It was His. It should have been your blood. But it was His. We don't ask that you be a member of Trinity Church. We ask that you be a member of God's family. That means that you've realized that Jesus Christ is a son of God who died on the cross to forgive you of your sin, and you've asked him to come in and change your life. The Holy Spirit has entered into that life. Your spirit, which was dead towards God, now has come alive to God. So when you take that bread, you're entering into covenant with the one, with the one who is the bread. And when you take that cup, you're in covenant with the one who has given his life for you. So when I ask the gentleman to come, we're going to dispense the bread first. They're going to come to you individually. They'll be in individual cups. We'll take that bread together. And then we'll do the same thing with the cup. But you know what? Jesus only ate this one time. But he told us to do it as often as we will to remember him. This is a memorial. But guess what? The second time he's going to have this with us will be the marriage supper of the Lamb. Until that day, we remember him with this bread and with this cup.
Simple words. Take, eat it. He could offer it. They had the choice. To take it. To be in covenant. You have the same choice. Take, eat. This is my body given for you. This do in remembrance of me. need to correct what I said earlier. Take eat is not in that translation. It's this do. And I meant to say that and I didn't. I just want to be accurate here. This do. This cup is a covenant. This do in remembrance of me. want to remind you as you leave here today we'll be taking our normal tithes and offerings in one plate another will be for the uh, helping hand fund that goes to our care commission to help to those that might be in need so be aware of that also I want you to stand because we're going to continue to worship we'll have our last song of worship today you know it says that after they had broken the bread and done this in the, in the upper room they departed before they departed, they sang a hymn. So let's stand together and uh, let's sing together as we close our worship service.